Good morning, everybody. I'm Muriel Bowser. I'm the mayor of Washington, D.C., and I'm here today to provide the district government's daily briefing on our response to COVID-19. Uh, as you know, we report each night uh, about uh, cases, and last night we reported 46 new cases. Uh, this is consistent with the increase in uh, positive results that we expected to see uh, with more testing and more private lab testing. As I've said before, we know as more testing gets done, uh, we will have more results, and right now we expect um, to see increases uh, in positive results. Uh, so again, we want to make the very simple message to our residents to stay at home, be a good neighbor, help us contain this virus, not only in our city and region, um, but in our nation. Uh, last night, I issued an order to close non-essential businesses in Washington, D.C. We need everyone to take this seriously. Uh, we have closed our schools bars, restaurants, entertainment facilities. Uh, we have modified and drastically reduced the d footprint of D.C. government workers reporting to businesses. Uh, and this non-essential business prohibition uh, will go into effect at 10 p.m. tonight. Uh, that does not include grocery stores. I want to make it very clear that grocery stores will, in, among other essential businesses, will remain open. More information is available at dc.gov uh, coronavirus. Tonight, uh, HSEMA will be issuing a wireless emergency alert uh, to make sure that all residents know that they should stay at home and only make essential trips and that non-essential businesses in Washington, D.C. will be closing. Tonight, we also want to share more information about what testing looks like in D.C., where we stand with procuring supplies, and how we're working together to continue making sure anyone who is clinically, um, who presents the clinical uh, needs for testing uh, is able to get one. Doctors are still making, uh, the only ones making decisions about testing, and once testing is done, hospitals and doctors' offices can either send those samples to a commercial lab or work with DC Health to send them to our public health lab. Right now, Dr. Nesbitt and Dr. Smith are working with hospitals and providers to make sure we are maximizing our collective resources and moving forward. We are also looking in the coming days to make announcements regarding uh, new drive-through testing sites similar to what we uh, have seen uh, at Children's Hospital. And Dr. Nesbitt will brief us on our citywide posture. As uh, they plan, uh, we want our medical providers to know that our public health lab has the capacity and ability to do more testing. If you need support with testing, reach out to DC Health. We can help, uh, and Dr. Smith uh, will see, say more about that in a moment. Uh, I also want to reiterate the point uh, that I have made and other governors have made. Uh, for too long now, um, we, we have been really waiting for a national signal uh, and help uh, with procurement. Uh, and we continue to call on the federal government uh, to prioritize procurement, production, and distribution uh, across our nation. Uh, we, however, continue to do everything that we can locally to make sure that D.C. government uh, and our medical professionals have the supplies that they, have, that they need. I have already directed $53 million to our city's COVID-19 response and recovery. Uh, this includes $15 million that will go through today uh, to purchase ventilators, more personal protective equipment, testing supplies, medical supplies, and other necessary equipment. Uh, right now, we are deploying uh, all needed supplies to our first responders, and we have the stock to do that. And at our hospitals, we have about 78 ICU beds available to, and 260 ventilators available. 
while this is enough for us right now, I'm told, uh, we know that we're going to need more and lives will depend on it. Just as we're coordinating in D.C., uh, we also need national leadership. We need states and hospitals and labs coordinating, not competing. And I know that the president is eager to get to the other side of this, as we all are. And I've said many times that we will get through it together, uh, and that's for our community and our entire country. So with that, I want to uh, turn to Dr. Nesbitt, followed by Dr. Smith, uh, who will talk about our uh, medical uh, space and service availability, testing availability, and then we'll be available for questions. Thank you, Madam Mayor, and thank you for your continued leadership during this time. And today we want to share more information about the current activities and proposed actions of hospitals and healthcare systems in the District of Columbia as it relates to testing for COVID-19. As stated before, I, along with the team at DC Health and Department of Forensic Sciences, have been working collaboratively with our hospitals and healthcare systems to increase our testing capacity and capabilities in the District of Columbia. The district's approach is a comprehensive one that focuses on testing residents who are in one of three priority groups that I will highlight later. To reduce the number of visits to fam by families to emergency departments for COVID-19 testing, Children's National Health System opened a drive-through walk-up location where primary care doctors in the region can refer young patients for COVID-19 specimen collection and testing. The site location, donated by Trinity Washington University in Northwest DC, can safely test children and young adults through 22 years of age who have been identified by their pediatrician or other primary care doctor as having symptoms of COVID-19. The specimens are collected and sent off-site to the program's laboratory partner, Quest Diagnostics, for testing. Community pediatricians using their clinical judgment to determine who they refer to the drive through walk-up location. They may choose to refer patients who are either at an increased risk for developing severe symptoms due to the child's underlying medical condition or because the child has, been an, has an immediate family member who is in a high-risk category. All referred patients receive the necessary paperwork and directions to access the drive through and walk-up site from their referring physician. When arriving at the site, photo identification and the referral firm form are required to enter. All results are then communicated back to the family by the referring doctor within three to five days. Within the coming days, the George Washington University Hospital plans to offer a drive through testing system that will focus on the symptomatic community requiring non-emergent testing. The hours for this testing site will be 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Additionally, they plan to coordinate another drive through in the East End in the coming weeks. Sibley Memorial Hospital is still in the planning process and is working closely with my team at DC Health and DC FEMS to work out location and operating plans. They hope to be online with drive through testing in the coming days. Kaiser Permanente has established a walk-up, drive-up COVID-19 testing site in DC near their Capitol Hill Medical Center, which is located at 700 Second Street Northeast. They also have five additional drive-up clinics in the Mid-Atlantic region. All Kaiser Permanente testing sites are for their members and requires a doctor's order and appointment for the test. In addition, Kaiser has implemented an expanded triage site adjacent to the Capitol Hill Medical Center location to accommodate an increased number of patients seeking care and will be open in the coming weeks. The MedStar Health e-visit is a faster, easier way to see a medical provider for basic express care needs. This service is a virtual video visit with a medical provider offering consultation, diagnosis, treatment, and even prescriptions when appropriate. The MedStar e-visit is available 24-7 and is open to anyone in the MedStar service area, which includes Washington, D.C. This service can be accessed via the MedStar e-visit app on a smartphone or tablet or on a PC by going directly to medstarhealth.org e-visit. You do not need to be a MedStar Health patient 
to access an e-visit provider. In other words, this platform is open to residents of the District of Columbia. Based on the outcomes of the e-visit, patients may be referred for COVID-19 testing from an e-visit provider to one of MedStar Health's testing sites with a physician's order. MedStar Health also has two urgent care facilities in the District of Columbia, one on Capitol Hill and one in Adams Morgan. Both facilities are open seven days a week from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. and offer tested for COVID-19 if indicated with a doctor's order. MedStar also has 12 additional urgent care centers in the Washington, D.C., Baltimore areas. As previously stated, this collaborative approach allows for specimen collection and testing resources within the District of Columbia to be used appropriately and efficiently and for health care providers and the local public health agency to reach those residents who are members of the city's priority groups. These three priority groups are aligned with those identified by the U.S. Public Health Service. The first group includes hospitalized patients and healthcare facility workers with COVID-19 symptoms of fever, cough, and shortness of breath. This ensures optimal care options for all hospitalized patients, lessens the risk of healthcare-associated infections, and maintains the integrity of the U.S. healthcare system. Many of the patients in this group are currently receiving testing within hospitals and through their health system's occupational health programs. The second priority group includes patients in long-term care facilities with symptoms, patients over the age of 65 with symptoms, and patients with underlying conditions such as diabetes, heart disease, and lung disease who also have symptoms, and first responders with symptoms. This priority ensures those at highest risk of complication of infection are rapidly identified and appropriately triaged. The third priority group includes critical infrastructure workers with symptoms, individuals who do not meet any of the above categories but have symptoms, and healthcare facility workers and first responders, and individuals with mild symptoms. This priority will allow us to test individuals, decrease community spread, and ensure the health of essential workers. I am pleased to announce that in addition to the access to testing resources described earlier, the district gov government will be launching a drive-through testing site on the campus of United Medical Center in the coming weeks. The leadership of United Medical Center has offered the use of substantial space on their campus that can be used without disruption to the operations and patient care, including emergency services. District government will partner with the local health system to provide the clinical support. The district government will provide testing through the Department of Forensic Services Public Health Laboratory, and our goal will be to serve at a maximum capacity 300 patients a day who are members of the previously outlined priority groups. The district's coordinated approach to testing demonstrates the all of community approach in action as each member of our healthcare system is playing a role in expanding and ensuring access to our population. We continue to access the rapidly evolving situation in the district, and I am reassured to know that the healthcare leaders in the nation's capital are doing their part during these unprecedented times. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Dr. Nesbitt. Good morning, everyone. I am Dr. Jennifer Smith, and I am the director of the Department of Forensic Sciences. And as that, I oversee the public health lab. At our public health lab, we have been able to quickly ramp up our testing capacity in a pretty short amount of time. You might remember that when we reported our first positive case on March 7th, at that time, our lab was processing about 15 test results per day. Just over two weeks later, we are now able to do about 10 times that, about 150 patients per day. By Tuesday, we expect more, uh, to more than triple that and be able to handle over 500 patients per day. Part of how we've been able to do this is because the FDA has approved new formats. Another reason we've been able to adjust so quickly is because our mayor and our council have been investing in our public health lab as a priority. 
And because of that, we have a lot of different types of equipment, a strong diversity of equipment, including robotic equipment, that allows us to make use of a variety of methods and supplies. When we began our testing, all laboratories had to use the FDA-approved tests from CDC. They had to use the same process, the same equipment, and the same ingredients for the test. The process was not approved for robotic equipment or high-throughput instrumentation. All the labs were vying for the same ingredients, and there was not enough to go around. But now our lab has options, and because of the equipment we have and the choice in tests, DC has a lot of options. Using equipment that is in the laboratory and working with manufacturers, the public health lab will begin utilizing sample to answer technology that will enhance our capacity to over 500 samples a day. But like the mayor said right now, we're not testing at capacity. On average, we're running only about 13 samples a day. We have no backlog of testing, and we can process tests quickly once we have a sample the results are ready to be delivered within 24 to 48 hours. We can do more, and we want to do more. We are working already with local hospitals to understand their testing capabilities. I encourage hospitals and medical providers to proactively reach out to DC Health if they need testing support for their priority group one patients and other patients they deem necessary for testing. Our public health lab is ready and eager to help. Thank you. Um, questions? Sam. Mayor, can you tell us a little more about the grant program for small businesses? I guess a number that might be, let's say, put out of, out of uh, business by the order today. Um, thank you for that, Sam. So we, I think you will recall that um, working with the council and an emergency piece of legislation which had many components, I think 26 in total, that are helping us uh, respond to this emergency. Uh, one component gave us the authority uh, to create a small business micro grant program. Uh, and the intent of that program is to help businesses that have been affected by COVID-19 uh, and to think about how those investments will also help the district get back on its feet when we get on the other side of COVID-19. Uh, so um, Deputy Mayor Falchicchio and his team um, have worked uh, together to come up with that program and we worked to find $25 million in our 2020 budget uh, to fund that program. And yesterday at 2 p.m., the application uh, went live, and people can find out about that at dc.gov coronavirus and look on um, our website to connect to that application. And I'll ask John to say a little bit more about what we know about the experience so far. Uh, thank you, Mayor. So, Sam, one thing that we do want to highlight to folks in the business community, nonprofit community who can apply, is that uh, last night we heard some feedback uh, about the application that the period of time in which they had to express that they had economic injury. So, we had it dated from January 31st, which is the standard that the SBA had actually put forth. We're uh, adjusting that to the date that the mayor uh, declared the public health emergency here in DC. So. Uh, anyone who could show injury between March 13th and the date they apply uh, can apply for that, and they do it at coronavirus.dc.gov slash recovery. What does it do help them pay salaries, or what, what does it do, and what is the upper limit that they can get? Sure, so the upper limit is $25,000, uh, and they can use it for a lot of different uh, purposes. All of that is enumerated on coronavirus.dc.gov slash recovery, but they can use it for things like paying salaries, uh, paying for uh, rent or utilities or inventory uh, as needed. What we wanted to do at the mayor's direction was to make it a low barrier, high flexibility program so that uh, they can get an immediate cash infusion. Uh, the deadline to apply is by March 31st. So, um, okay, so they can, do they have to pay this money back? No, it's a micro grant, so it's a grant, and it uh, does not have to be paid back.
<laughs> There's a story right now about a son of a Pakistani army officer who worked for the IMF. Uh, he died at a district hospital uh, from COVID-19 related um, issues. Can you confirm, is, is this person part of the district count? And uh, can you confirm his death? I cannot. Going back to the drive through site, Dr. Nesbitt, um, the drive through site at UMC that you're working to set up in the next couple of weeks, is that different from the one that you're working with with the National Guard? It's the same one. So we have, um, given that we have not had um, the support we were initially anticipating with the federal government, we have decided to move forward and establish different partnerships to create a district uh, site. And our district site will include us having a clinical partnership with a local health system, uh, sourcing supplies, partnering with the Department of Forensic Services now that they have increased laboratory capacity, and using the United Medical Center cap campus. Uh, we may utilize some of the other federal assets um, and other assets that um, would have been made available to us if we had a federal partnership, uh, but in a different capacity. A couple of weeks from now? Uh, it, it's, we are working as quickly as we can, uh, but we do need to be able to source potentially some additional supplies depending on what our clinical provider can offer. Uh, given that uh, in my earlier comments, I mentioned that all of the district health systems are operating uh, sites on their own campuses. We have to be able to identify what they will need to utilize in terms of medical supplies, personal protective equipment at their uh, individually hosted sites, and what things we will need to procure through the district government for our partnership site. So, Dr. Ernest, can I follow up on yes, that? Sir. So, <clears throat> there was a lot to unpack in what you listed out there, and yes, we sir. appreciate that staff's going to get us that written out for us. But could you just kind of break it down for people who are sitting at home right now sure. and want to get tested, don't know, is it going to get easier in the coming days, and what's your best advice for people, you know, who are wondering, how do I get tested, and why, is it, why are some people getting results quickly and others are waiting days? Sure, Mark. So uh, there's a, it's multifactorial. Uh, the, the intentionality of highlighting priority groups is that we are operating against a national back, backdrop that every time a new testing modality, as Dr. Smith highlighted, becomes available, it inspires a, um, a commentary to the general public in the United States that testing will be made widely available to every individual in the country who desires to be tested. It's important for us to remember that uh, given that there is a number of factors that comes to operating a testing site or offering testing, including the need to keep healthcare personnel safe and to keep individuals who have a risk of being exposed to COVID-19 uh, that could compromise their health if they are otherwise in a healthcare setting safe. So those are things that we need to keep foremost in our mind, that if we have individuals who should be staying home, that who may be asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic, uh, desiring to be tested when they otherwise are not in those three priority groups, we want to make sure that we are consistent with our messaging around that. Additionally, when we make a decision to operate a uh, testing sites such as some of these high throughput testing sites that I just described, um, there are additional factors that go into it. One, finding an ideal site or location, having the healthcare personnel in addition to the logistics and support personnel, having the actual testing supplies, having a laboratory partner, and having the personal protective equipment, and then having the way to manage the data and a way of getting the results. So there is a difference between having a laboratory partner and having the testing supplies. So for example, to try to make this a little bit easier, this is part of what is required at the actual site to test the patient. So I'm not gonna open this because this is very precious at this time. So when people are talking about swabs and healthcare providers needing to have a testing kit, this is what they are referring to. So there's two cotton swabs in here that actually go into the nasal passages, and then you have to put it into this tube here um, that helps to keep the specimen safe for transport to a laboratory. Now, doctor, laboratories like the Dr. Smith's laboratory then take what's in this tube and they put it into several different types of instruments or platforms that Dr. Smith mentioned. 
the more platforms that a laboratory has and the different types of reagents that they have help to determine their processing time and their turnaround time. The public health lab now is only receiving 13 on average of these a day. That allows them to have a turnaround time of 24 hours, and they can get that result back to our healthcare providers um, in a relatively short time. Some of the commercial labs are receiving thousands, tens of thousands of these from healthcare providers from across the country. And the amount of platforms that they have to process these is unknown. And their response times are now getting into five days, six days, seven days. And some of our healthcare systems are using those commercial laboratories. And that's why you hear patients' experiences with some of the testing sites or some of the healthcare systems. If their test, this tube, is being sent to one of those commercial labs, their wait for their result may be prolonged. What we now know is many of our hospitals are using a laboratory in their hospital. They just send this tube downstairs to their laboratory, and their laboratory is processing that result very quickly on their campus for that first priority group that I described. So the healthcare workers, the inpatients in that hospital, they're processing that on campus. And we want them to do that. We want them to prioritize that group. And this is why that's critically important. We want to make sure our healthcare workers are kept safe, that if they are infected or impacted by COVID-19, we get them the resources that they need, that they self-quarantine so that they don't infect other healthcare workers and patients, and that we can get them back to work to be on the front lines of this pandemic. The other thing is if that there is a patient in the hospital who is being tested the sooner we know whether or not they have COVID-19 as the reason for their symptoms and the reason for their hospitalization, the, reason, the, the faster that hospitals can make decisions about how they're using those inpatient or hospital resources. So some of the hospital resources that are used while they're waiting for a test include that precious personal protective equipment that we've been talking about. Those surgical masks, those N95 respirators, the gloves, the gowns, the face shields, all of that equipment has to be used. The rooms, the negative pressure rooms, the high airflow rooms, all of those things are used until you know the patient status and once you know the patient status if they're positive. And again, some of the hospitals have made decisions in terms of how they use their clinical personnel, which personnel are caring for patients on a designated respiratory, a respiratory ward. So all of these things help us to make decisions about where we build laboratory capacity at the public health lab, how our health system providers are making decisions about what to process in-house, how to partner with the city to use the public health lab more efficiently, and which tests can go out to commercial laboratories. I also want to underscore that we are making decisions about who to test if it's going to change the clinical management or the public health management of that individual. Okay, so if you're going to have to self-quarantine or self-isolate while you're waiting for your test result, we recognize that it may be a high period of anxiety for you to wait a difference from 24 hours or seven hours. But if you have mild symptoms and you're going to remain at your home, we are asking for your patience during that period of time. It's very important for us to get timely results for those patients who are in the hospital who may be critically ill and where it may actually impact the clinical management where they may need to get access to those compassionate care medications and where it may actually impact how and where we care for them in our hospitals. Do we have any COVID-19 cases of people in nursing homes or senior centers in the district? Any positives in those? Uh, it is a data element that we are keeping very uh, close eye on, and we're working with those, our partners at that time. We are still prioritizing that group for uh, contact tracing, and we have not identified those risks at this time. Mayor, um, one of the, the, the questions that's come up, for example, was uh, whether these businesses that are not considered essential could do curbside. Is that anything in consideration? If specifically, I think it was like a music store. We those. want people to stay at home except for essential business. Um, we've outlined what those essential businesses are. Um, and so we are only allowing curbside 
for essential businesses that provide food. And, um, there have been questions about unemployment, uh, being able to get it into the system, issues. The other day I think you said that you should use Internet Explorer if you were going on. And I understand the number of cases is really sore. Can you give us some kind of assessment of the situation at employment services these days? Uh, well, we have some very dedicated personnel who are working feverishly to not only take calls, but to evaluate the claims once they've come in. Um, they're deluged, as you might expect, with people who are unexpectedly out of work. Um, and looking uh, to make an unemployment claim. Uh, we've added some capacity. Um, we were able to get a, a call center, um, out of town call center, that is going to give us additional call capacity. Um, so we expect, as, as more people have already entered the system and we have more call capacity, that wait times for, um, for calling the center will go down. We still tell people, however, uh, it's best to go online and fill out your application. Uh, there are a couple of points um, that I want to reiterate that require some change in our computer system that isn't automatic, like, so we're working with the vendor to make that change about the question about are you seeking work in, in um, seven days. Um, and so we have been able to waive the seven-day requirement, waiting period, uh, and the seeking work requirement. Uh, so some of that, those changes to the system are in the works, and we expect them to advance. I don't believe that, that anybody is being kicked off, but let me, let me do you have that answer, John? Sure. Uh, so we are still having some folks experience difficulty. Some folks have uh, had difficulty trying it once and then have tried it the second time, and for whatever reason it worked. Uh, we know that as of yesterday there were 21,000 uh, claims filed. Uh, so we do know that people are getting through. Uh, as the mayor mentioned, the best uh, tips for everybody is to use a laptop or desktop uh, and to use uh, Internet Explorer uh, to apply. Uh, and the call center remains open. Uh, but it is uh, still being uh, stretched to its limits, so there are long wait times. So right now our, our recommendation to everyone is to use laptop or desktop and to use Internet Explorer, and we have seen that people are getting through uh, when they do that. Some people are reporting that they're getting denial notices, and I think DOE has put something out about this to ignore them. Can you talk about Sure, so there, that's... Uh, what the mayor was referring to about the, we have uh, done a couple of waivers, uh, including how long someone has to wait before they file and uh, whether they have to seek work on a regular basis in order to keep getting the benefit. Uh, the technology, the system is still updating uh, so that it can reflect that. Uh, so for right now, uh, folks can go, they don't have to wait for that seven day waiting period and they also don't have to seek work uh, per the waivers that were issued on Friday. Right, but what if they've received a denial notice? Is that a legitimate denial notice, or is that an error because they thought they had applied too soon? So I can't speak to it because I don't know what denial notice they received or why they did, but if it was for uh, applying too soon, we're working to process that benefit, and then if they uh, got it because they hadn't been seeking work, we're working to waive that as well. We're getting the technology to uh, catch up to the waivers. John, just quickly. One second. So, what, so let me just finish with um, your your question mark. So uh, I'll make sure that the, the director lets us know if there are some communications that have gone out, and we will update that. Sam? Yeah, I was just w wanting to, to make it get clear. It's not necessarily D.C. residents that are affected here, right? It's just whoever sure. works here. Is that how? how sure. So the way it? unemployment works is you pay the unemployment benefit in the jurisdiction that you work, and so therefore you claim the benefit. Uh, in the jurisdiction where you work. So there could be folks from Maryland or Virginia who've paid because their workplace is in D.C. Uh, yes, sir. Can we get back to the essential businesses? Um, can you give us a sense as to 
why construction, the construction industry and the workers, the consent is essential, we have a lot of workers working in close proximity with each other. Um, we, I think you note from my order that we refer to a federal homeland security guidance about what critical and essential infrastructure is during the COVID response. Uh, it's pretty exhaustive. It covers a number of industries and buildings and trades and all of that are, are part of the essential category. Yes, you have a, you have a yeah. question from the... From the from the wide, wide from, world. Yeah, I'm the voice of God as well. <laughs> uh, so from Martin uh, at WAMU, what are the challenges DC faces in responding to a crisis like this without being a state? Are there any things that you're surprised about the city's lack of statehood has impacted the ability to respond quickly? Uh, that's, a, that's an interesting question. Um, let, let me start by saying this, that I think that, uh, that our response as, you know, I call us the 51st state, uh, we're on our way, but certainly uh, we are unique in the American system. Um, and the things that we've done, the, the, not just uh, our administration, but previous administrations and certainly our partners on the council has put the district in a, a good position to respond to em in an emergency. So that's helpful. Uh, we have done some things differently to make sure that we are among the states, uh, whether it is on um, the governor's calls with the president uh, that, that we're on, and we had to make, make sure that we were represented. Uh, whether it's on uh, calls with the National Governors Association, uh, which we've been on to make sure that we are making um, our issues known. So all of those things have been important. Uh, what's very different is that we don't have two senators. Uh, we know that the Senate passed the bill, which we'll dig into today. Uh, and so having our interests represented in the Senate, uh, we, we just don't have uh, as a the city, county, state, federal district uh, that we that we are. Uh, we also have some unique uh, challenges in that uh, we do have federal assets here and my communication uh, includes the 700,000 people of the District of Columbia, but also the lawmakers um, from all over the, the country who have been reporting to the Capitol, the Speaker of the House, uh, in terms of how she's handling operations at the Capitol. Uh, the National Park Service and the Department of the Interior, who are responsible for a lot of federal land uh, in the District of Columbia. Uh, so our, our issues uh, have been different. And I think moving forward, when we talk about the recovery, uh, we will continue to make sure that our interests are, are known. Uh, I briefed our, our Congresswoman yesterday uh, and got a sense from her what she's working on and what we're dealing with. But I think that uh, we have to make sure that during the recovery, our interests are always represented. Uh, this is from Fennett from The Post. Uh, American College of Obstetrics and Gynecologists declared pregnant women to be at-risk population of COVID-19. Uh, will DC give priority to expectant mothers? I think priority relating to testing. I think that the, the doctor's remarks about priority groups um, holds for that question. Uh, and to show we're not screening these questions in any way, Sophie from the Washington Times wants to know how your call with the union uh, went referring to the Department of Corrections. Uh, it went well. Would you care to expand on Sure. That? So uh, 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 Sophie, is it, uh, yes. uh, asked several questions about uh, the DC jail, uh, and I think yesterday uh, I um, explained to everybody uh, that we have a lot of our, our workers who are teleworking and working remotely, um, but we have a lot of essential functions of government where people continue to report uh, to their workplaces, and uh, the DC jail uh, is one of those. Uh, and what I wanted to make very, very clear to everybody is that all of our workers uh, we put their uh, health and safety at the forefront of all that we do. Uh, and I've been so proud of our team for stepping up to provide the essential work that they do every day, um, but uh, also during, during this time. And so that's what I uh, communicated uh, not only to that union leader, but to other union leaders throughout this 
um, pandemic response uh, that we were asking for them to step up and serve the residents of the District of Columbia that 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 they serve uh, and that we wanted to make clear what the lines of communication uh, are uh, to get their needs addressed. And so that's what we did. That's what we discussed. Uh, Mitch from the city paper uh, sounds like the public health lab will now have increased capacity But I'm still unclear on exactly why the public health lab wasn't receiving as many tests previously uh, Why are the providers opting to use private lab testing instead of the public health lab? We I don't want to speculate on why the private providers are making the choices that they are But what our job is is to let them know um, that we're open we have additional capacity, uh, and we are looking forward to working with them. Mayor, when they asked about the jail, the, the, one of the big issues was bringing in prisoners that had been, you know, perhaps they were going to bring the virus into the prison. Did that come up with your discussion? It actually didn't come up during my discussion um, with the union leader, but it, it, we kind of talked about it after you raised it with, with our leadership. And one thing that we should recognize is that a DC a person coming into DC jail outside of a pandemic is already really screened. Um, people should know that that they are uh, they're examined and coming into the jail. We have on-site medical facilities at the jail, um, and so if there was any indication of a person who needed additional uh, medical support, they would have it. Go ahead. Uh, Mitch from City Paper, uh, on a possible shelter in uh, place order, is the mayor waiting to coordinate uh, with the governors? Uh, would she like to order shelter in place without agreement f uh, from the governors? And what matrix are uh, is the governor? Is, excuse me, is the mayor relying on in making this decision? Uh, I, I, sp I spoke pretty extensively about. Um, uh, closing down non-essential business uh, in the district, and that that would be what my response to that question is. Uh, on uh, people who are able to either apply for these grants to help them get through or unemployment, uh, there are a lot of musicians, artists who are out of work who don't earn money the traditional way. They're you know they're independent contractors and whatnot, and and they boss everything. Is there relief for them for for musicians, artists, people in that community? Well, I, one thing um, now I only heard briefly, and I haven't been fully briefed out on what the federal pac package is. Uh, I think there is a discussion about expanding unemployment eligibility uh, to that group of workers. Um, so I want to check on that, Mark. I think we also have some limited ability in our small business uh, micro-grant program. Um, and when I say limited, I mean because we have a lot of need and we, we have identified a small pot of money, um, basically. Uh, so I don't want to give the, the impression that that's, all, that that's what's happening. Um, I should step back a little bit because we talked about our local relief. Um, but the first line, as we see it, is federal relief. Uh, and what's coming, what the government will be able to give every American in terms of cash in their hands is going to be mightily important. I know that they have also made a big pot of money available um, for small business. So we'll look into how that money is actually going to get into the hands of our businesses and help facilitate that. Um, we are also very interested in how the the, the earmarked money or the, I don't know if that's the right word, but the money for states and local jurisdictions is going to get down to us so that we can pass it down uh, to our residents and businesses. So I think there's a lot to be unpacked there um, that, that will help individuals and businesses, but we're going to need some time to understand it. Yesterday you were very candid about the financial pressures on the government given the lack of incoming revenue stream and whatnot, and you've extended the tax deadline for income tax uh, for residents, but so far there's been no talk of relief as far as property tax relief for homeowners and property owners in the district. Can you tell property owners if you're planning on giving them any kind of relief at all on paying their property Well, I, I will say this, Mark, it will be very unlikely that we are able to do that. Uh, it would be uh, detrimental, if not catastrophic, for the district's cash flow. And if the district is going to be able to pay its bills, uh, we have to maintain 
uh, a consistent cash flow. Uh, and keep in mind that we provide, we continue to provide very vital services, police, fire, uh, all of our staff, uh, though they're not reporting uh, to their offices, they are still on our payroll and still providing critical services to the residents of the district. Um, so we are, our, we are very closely watching um, the financial health of our city. Uh, last question yeah. uh, from Amanda uh, at the city paper. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, for the health director, uh, you mentioned the third category of testing is individuals with mild symptoms. What does mild symptoms mean, and how does that differ uh, from other groups with symptoms? Yeah, so we describe the symptoms of COVID-19 as being fever, cough, and shortness of breath. And, and when we classify someone as having mild symptoms, uh, the best way that we've thought about how to um, describe this is that if you hearken back to six months ago, before we were dealing with COVID-19 or the novel coronavirus, if these were symptoms that you would not have sought uh, urgent care services or emergency services for, and you would have stayed at home and provided yourself self-care, we consider those to be mild symptoms. Okay, last question for the room. Yes, sir. Right. I mean, actually, can we get back to some of the challenges with the employment site a little bit as well, too? Um, wondering if, if you think that it's acceptable that the city's unemployment site only functions on, you know, the outdated browser, right? On sort of laptops and No, we think it needs to be improved. Um, and we're currently in uh, the process, and you're going to stretch my memory here, but we are in uh, a procurement process now. Uh, to update that system. It needs to be updated. It's been funded and planned. Unfortunately, this pandemic happened before uh, it was in, the new system is in place. Sam. Personal protection equipment, one of my colleagues is interested in that. When you talk with the um, corrections people, um, I guess that was one of their concerns. So I think you've heard us discuss uh, already, Sam, that the personal protective equipment is prioritize for people providing medical care. And guards at the D.C. jail are not providing medical care. There are medical personnel at the D.C. jail, and they would be outfitted with the appropriate gear, supplies. Can we get back to testing numbers? Final, final question. Yeah, final question. Uh, sorry, I'm sorry to be like Columbo, but the last okay. question. Mm -hmm. um, I'm getting back to testing numbers. I mean, how much of the numbers going up over the last week? Dr. Smith talked about numbers at the public health lab. So I want to quantify them. But also give us a sense as to whether it's a spike in cases, a spike in the disease spreading, as to or if it's a reflection in testing. Kind of give us a sense as to why those numbers have gone up. Sure. Uh, so we have what's called an uh, an epidemiolo epidemiology curve, or affectionately an epi curve. And we map out that epi curve, and it will probably be a few more days before that curve settles. And it goes back to some of my uh, comments to Mark. Uh, we know that some of our laboratories and some of our hospitals, rather, who are using commercial laboratories have outstanding tests for seven or eight days. Those lab results come to us um, only after, lab, after the labs have been um, finalized. So we can only add to our epi curve when we receive that result. So in a very basic way, um, when I get a test result that is positive or negative, we can only map that out and tell you if that individual was tested seven, eight, nine days ago when their symptoms started and their date of a positive test at that time that we received that result. Received that result. So. I ha know I have hospitals that have over 100 or so test results that are pending. Um, these are not people who are hospitalized uh, because they are turning around those test results in rather short order. So on any given day, when we post that there are 46 new positive cases or 32 new positive cases, that does not mean all of those people were tested the day prior or even two days prior. Those tests could be over more than a week old. What is the DC number today? Pardon? What is the D.C. number of positive tests today? We, uh, we reported 46 new cases where results came into us yesterday. So, oh, 183, yeah. 183. Oh, 183 is the total number of cases. I, my apologies for. Thank you, everybody.